Now, here's Dr. Scott Hahn. The presentation is going to be dealing with the Pope, and I've subtitled it Holy Father, because I hope that this week will give you a chance to integrate in your own heart a vision of the church that Christ has established as the family of God. This is a theme that Vatican II really emphasized. Many people think that Vatican II's primary vision of the church as a communion was summarized in the phrase, the people of God. But the Old Testament roots for that phrase, people of God, Am Yahweh, actually has as its primary meaning, family of God. That term people in Hebrew, Am, literally denotes kinship. So it could be translated kinsman or family of God. And that's how most Old Testament scholars translate it. So when we look at the Pope, as we will this morning, we're going to be looking at him not as some tyrant, not as some authoritarian know-it-all, and not as some magician who could just kind of concoct a new revelation to, you know, satisfy all parties or anything like that. We're going to be looking at a father figure that Christ has established over the family that he's purchased with his own blood. Now, there are many misconceptions that people have. They sometimes think that the teaching of the church is that the Pope is infallible, therefore he can't sin. That's nonsense. Uh, the, the present pontiff goes to confession, I understand, at least once a week. He's got to have something to confess you know, for it to be a valid sacrament administered to him. Others think that he always says the best thing at the right time. No, uh, the church has never insisted upon the fact that the the Pope will always say the best thing at the right time. Rather, the teaching of the Church would allow for the Pope to perhaps postpone out of cowardice a right saying. Or when he says the truth, when he teaches the truth, he might do so in a way that includes some ambiguity. And so we're responsible as Catholics to understand not only what the Church teaches, but what the Church doesn't teach to help clear up these misconceptions. The Church teaches, in a simple summary, that the Holy Father, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, as the successor to Peter and the Vicar of Christ, when he speaks as the universal teacher from the chair of Peter in defining faith and morals, does so with an infallible charism or an infallible gift through the Holy Spirit so that we can give to him the full assent of our intellect and of our will. And we can hear the voice of Christ coming to us through the voice of the Pope when he's speaking in this capacity. Now we're going to flesh out some of the meanings of this as time goes on, but there are three basic issues or problems. First of all, can we prove papal primacy? That is, that the Pope is not just the first among equals, but that he has a certain primacy, a unique supremacy in relationship to all other bishops. And we have to begin by showing that Jesus conferred this gift upon Peter. Then secondly, we have to establish the doctrine of papal succession. If we can prove from the Bible that Peter was granted by Jesus a certain primacy, that doesn't go far enough. We then have to go on to establish papal succession. That is, Peter had successors to whom would be entrusted the same gift or charism. And then thirdly, we have to establish the evidence for papal infallibility. That is, that God grants a gift to the successors of Peter for them not to give new revelation. The church insists that no popes have ever given new revelation. Revelation has been once and for all deposited by Christ through his apostles, and with the death of the last apostle came the close of all public revelation. The popes, in a sense, are given the task of of preserving and of transmitting, explaining and enforcing that revelation, but of not, not giving new revelation. So that third doctrine is the doctrine of papal infallibility, that when they transmit, when they explain, when they enforce it, they are granted a charism or a special spiritual gift, preserving them from error. Infallibility, in a sense, is a negative gift. It doesn't mean he always says the right thing. It's not always at the right time but that when he speaks with his authority that Christ gives to him, we have this divine guarantee, because Christ promises that I will build my church. The church of Christ is not a human institution first and foremost. Jesus identifies it as his own, my church, and the institution and edification, the upbuilding of the church, Jesus claims for himself, I will build my church.
And so, whatever instruments that Jesus chooses to use, ultimately are going to be under his control, and he's going to be using them with this ultimate intention in mind of building his church, of governing his family, and thus bringing about the guarantee that he imparts in Matthew 16, as we'll see, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and will not prevail against the rock, which is Peter and the popes who are in the line of succession with Peter. Now, I've just, grand, I've just given to you a, a very quick bird's eye view of all that we have to do. Now I have to confess from the bottom of my heart with total sincerity that we're not going to be able to do an adequate job this morning. <laughs> this is just too much. If I talk as rapidly as I possibly could and try to get everything across and try to go through all the evidence and demonstrate all the arguments and everything else, I still couldn't get through 20% of it. So I'm not going to talk your ears off. I'm not going to try to plow through all of this and take three or four hours. Instead, I'm going to try to focus upon the mountain peaks, the real highlights, so that you can see from Scripture and from history and from the church the key ideas that we need to use and present and share as evidence and support for our belief and our practice as Catholics. We're going to first and primarily look at Scripture, but we're also going to look at the historical development of the church's understanding, and then finally, we're going to focus upon some of the church's teachings uh, relative to the Pope and his authority. Now, before I go on, having given you this qualification, I think I need to recommend some sources for your study over, above, and beyond our time this morning. First of all, I'd like to recommend a book entitled Catholicism and Fundamentalism, the Attack on Romanism by Bible Christians. It's written by Carl Keating, the founder and director of Catholic Answers in San Diego. You may also wish to write him for a catalog of other materials that Catholic Answers publishes. But this book is a very adequate treatment of all of the common objections against the Catholic faith. Many of them we're not going to be able to cover this week. And how, from Scripture and also church history, we can answer these in a very convincing and persuasive way. The second book that I recommend is by Dr. Alan Schreck. It's entitled Catholic and Christian, an Explanation of Commonly Misunderstood Catholic Beliefs. This is a very positive and constructive, I'd say pastoral presentation of the biblical evidence and the historical reasons for the Catholic beliefs. This is not directed as much against fundamentalists as perhaps evangelical Protestants, and it really helps them a great deal. There are two other books written by one of the greatest philosophers of our century, Stanley Yockey. The first one is on my right, and on this rock, the witness of one land and two covenants, he shows geographical and historical and biblical background for what Jesus intended to mean and what, what Jesus intended to say when he renamed Simon Rock or Peter. Very interesting book. Then this other book of his, The Keys of the Kingdom, A Tool's Witness to Truth, focuses upon not the rock so much, but the keys of the kingdom that Jesus entrusted to Peter and his successors. These two are full of some of the most valuable information, interesting data that you'll come across. At a more popular level and something you can read in 10 or 15 minutes, uh, Catholic Answers puts out two little brochures, two little tracts or pamphlets. One is entitled Papal Infallibility, and the other one is entitled Peter and the Papacy, and you can write Catholic Answers for that. And lastly, if you'll permit me, I'll recommend a tape that I made sitting at a desk about a year ago up in my study in Joliet, Illinois, uh, before we moved to Steubenville. It's entitled Peter and the Papacy. And in this tape, I focus primarily upon Matthew 16, verses 17 through 19. I focus upon three aspects that we're going to begin with this morning. The rock, the keys, and the guarantee of Jesus that the gates of hell will not prevail. The rock, the keys, and the guarantee of Jesus that the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, that's going to be our starting point, and I'm going to take a liberty here, if you'll permit me, of summarizing what I've said on that tape. Not because I assume you've listened to the tape or because you will, but because you can, if you're so interested. And I don't want to go into an hour's worth of detail just on one passage when there are other important passages to cover as well. But those three ideas are closely associated with the very important passage that we find in the first gospel, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 17 through 19. Let me read that passage, and then we'll back up and consider those three aspects. 
Let's drop back to verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Rather impressive testimony, because these people constitute the Old Testament Hall of Fame of saints here. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And as is characteristic throughout Matthew's Gospel, Peter steps forward, or I should say speaks up. Peter's the only one to walk on water. Peter's the one who often speaks up representative of the twelve disciples. Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Christos, the, the, the anointed one in Greek, or the Messiah in Hebrew, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, Petra, and on this rock, Petras, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, let me just get a little personal here. Six or seven years ago, a couple years before I became a Catholic, I had been studying the doctrine of the covenant. I came to an understanding of the covenant as a family, and with this insight, I began to discover all kinds of exciting truths, novel innovations, new discoveries that I thought were really undiscovered before. And then as I began to dig deeper into the, these libraries, I noticed that time and time again, Catholic scholars, I mean, not just recently, but going all the way back to the first, second, third, fourth, fifth centuries in the Middle Ages, the saints and the doctors of the church were consistently coming up with all of my brand new discoveries and teaching them with a kind of ho-hum attitude like, you all know, such and such. And that really, at first, it provoked me. And then it scared me. And then it led me to dig deeper and deeper into Catholic sources to see how many of my discoveries they may have found, and practically every one of them, except the ones that were false. The Pope, though, was a different matter. For me, the idea of a Pope who claims primacy and succession and infallibility was a presumption, an arrogant presumption that no man should make. But then one day, as I was working through the Gospel of Matthew, because that stresses, that Gospel builds on the Old Testament more than any other, and especially the idea of David's kingdom. That really seems to be the central thrust of Matthew's Gospel, that Jesus is the son of David, and he's establishing the kingdom of David. That's how Matthew introduces Jesus. He's the only one of the four Gospel writers who traces his genealogy right back to David. And he says, Jesus is the son of David at the very start of Matthew. That's a common and prominent theme throughout the gospel. So I wanted to dig deep and see what I found in this particular passage. And on the basis of that study, I made some discoveries. First of all, I discovered that when you read in verse 17, Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I discovered that all the evidence points to the fact that Peter is the rock. Now you might say that's as plain as the nose on your face, so what's the excitement of that discovery? Well, non-Catholics are frequently claim that it's Peter's faith that's, that Jesus is speaking of, or Peter's confession that Jesus is speaking of when he says this rock, or other Protestants object and say, no, Jesus says, and you are Petros, you are Petros, which is little rock, and on this Petra, the Greek word for large rock, I will build my church. And so some Protestants object to the Catholic view and say, what Jesus is really saying is, you're a little pebble, and on this rock, namely Christ, the rock, Corinthians 10, 4, and so on, I will build my church. Now, the closer I studied, the more I realized that those positions were untenable simply untenable. And I'm going to share in a few minutes the fact that most conservative, anti-Catholic Protestant scholars today will admit that readily and candidly. 
The more I dug, the more I found that the evidence pointed to the fact that Jesus was speaking of Peter. Peter's the rock. Peter just said, you are the Christos. So Jesus says, you are the Petros. There's a little parallelism there. You are the son of the living God, and you are the son of Jonah. Simon Bar-Jonah, you are the Petros. Now, people could say, wait a second. There is a distinction in the Greek language between Petros, Peter's name, and Petra. Petros can mean stone, whereas Petra often means big rock. The problem with that is twofold. First of all, Jesus probably didn't speak Greek when he was with his disciples. I mean, that is held by 99.9% .9 of all scholars. It's overwhelmingly unlikely that Jesus, in his normal conversation, spoke Greek. What's almost certain is that he spoke Aramaic. And in the Aramaic, there's only one word that could possibly be used. And Jeremias and Kuhlman and other scholars have pointed to the fact that if Jesus spoke Aramaic, he only could have said, you are Cephas, and on this Cephas I build my church. And so, given our knowledge of the Aramaic language, there's no possibility for Jesus to have made the distinction between little stone and big rock. The Aramaic language doesn't allow it. Well, somebody could say, well, the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to use two different words. Well, that's true. Because Petra is the word in Greek that's normally used for large rock. But you don't name, I should say, Petra is the Greek word that means large rock, but it's in the feminine form, right? In other words, the gender of this Greek word Petra, large rock, is feminine. You do not apply a feminine form of the word in order to name a male. You adopt it by giving it the masculine form. In other words, what Matthew was doing, led by, guided by the Holy Spirit, was something that was rather obvious and practically necessary. And that was to take the Greek form of Jesus saying, and start by saying, I will build my church on this massive stone, this Petra in the feminine, but then to show that Peter gets the name rock in its proper masculine form. You wouldn't name him, you know, Josephina, or Rockina, or, you know, something like that. You give him the masculine form of the word. I should also add that there is absolutely no archaeological evidence from antiquity for anybody having been named Peter before Simon. In other words, Jesus was taking a word that had never been used, as far as all the many records we have are concerned, never was used to designate an individual person. And Jesus gives that name, gives that word to Simon. Again, it suggests the fact that Simon is the rock. I should say a few things along these lines, um, because I mentioned that I have these Protestant quotes. I have note cards that I actually put together when I was preparing a paper for a graduate seminar on this subject. I was still a Protestant minister. And I was taking a graduate seminar on the Gospel of Matthew, and the professor was a Protestant, he was a Lutheran. And uh, he knew what I, what I wanted to do for my project, and so I presented this paper, Peter and the Keys, and uh, I worked at it because I knew that he might not be open to my conclusions, and I knew what my conclusions were going to be at the end of my research. They were rather Catholic, neither Presbyterian nor uh, Lutheran. And so uh, I worked and worked and I put these note cards together. And uh, when I made the presentation, I should, I, I should probably add this, it was a very interesting experience because all the other students who presented papers, the professor encouraged the rest of the students to interact with the presenter. And he seldom, if ever, asked questions interacted. He wanted the students to get involved. But when it came to presenting a 30-page paper, presenting the evidence for the fact that Peter is the rock and that the keys denote succession and that the Catholic position is right, not one student spoke up for the entire two-and-a-half-hour seminar. He did all the talking, and we even went over. I, I ended up leaving the classroom, I think, 45 minutes after the seminar was supposed to end. It was the most grueling cross-examination I'd ever undergone. And I might add, I had intestinal digestive problems for about a week afterwards because of how nerve-wracking it was. But at the end of the whole ordeal, he said, you know, I, I think your paper's flawless. The only fault that I found is uh, you have the middle initial on one person's name and one of your footnotes wrong. He said, I think your argument's persuasive, too. I'm just grateful that I don't think that Matthew is historically reliable, so I don't have to follow the conclusions. I said, well, I'm glad you said that, you know, and not me. But Protestants are often ready to admit the fact that Peter is the rock and that the keys of succession are given to him 
to imply an office that will be filled by successors.